It begins with one man who dreams of doing something that has never been done before. To produce a car that goes safely supersonic is the, the greatest element of the, the land speed record I think there ever could be. It's the, the sub four minute mile, you know, in athletic terms, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the greatest of the lot. It ends with a 10 ton car hurtling across the American desert at 763 miles per hour. It's traveling faster than its own sound in almost total silence until <laughs> this is the inside story of Richard Noble and his mission to build the fastest car on earth and break the sound barrier It's May, and Richard Noble and his team touch down in Jordan in the Middle East for the all-important tests of their thrust car. Money and time are running out, and they have just four weeks to prove to themselves and their sponsors that their extraordinary design actually works. It's a really great moment. We had crises after crises after crises. Hi, I don't but we've done it, we've actually got here, so I can't tell you how good it is. Yeah, of course we got here. It's taken many years and several million pounds just to get this far. Almost bankrupt, team leader Noble has gambled everything on proving his car is capable of even attempting the sound barrier later in the year. We've got a number of enormous problems actually coming our way now. Well, the most single important thing is that we get the car up to 600 miles an hour possibly beyond, but certainly 600 miles an hour. That gives us credibility. That proves that we've got a car and a team and a driver that's a viable contender for, of course, the big battle in America. It's vital they prove their car quickly because they have a rival. American Craig Breedlove, who is ahead in the race. His car has already got within 100 miles per hour of the sound barrier, a speed the British team can only dream of. But this is dangerous and unknown territory. On Breedlove's last run on the American Black Rock Desert, his car suddenly flipped on its side and careered off course at 670 miles per hour. God almighty. Miraculously, it righted itself again, and Breedlove was unhurt. Now, he's rebuilding for the battle with Noble in the autumn. While Breedlove fixes his car, Noble has one extra time to catch up. But the American desert is now flooded for the summer, so desperate and with nowhere flat enough to test the car, Noble has turned to the local knowledge of his supporters club. I was here in the army 50 years ago, and I used to travel across here twice a week with a tanker full of water to take it out to our base camps. So when it was mentioned to me at the motor show that they couldn't run it because they had nowhere to run it, and I said, well, I know where there's a flat desert. And Richard said, really, where's that then? I said, in Jordan, and Richard said, Jordan? That's not too far, and I know the king. I thought to myself, gee, I hope I've done the right thing. I hope it's still the same, because my wife said they probably built a block of flats on it. Noble's team arrive in the scorching Jordanian desert kingdom weeks behind schedule. Summer is coming and the temperatures are rising daily. In a few weeks, it will simply be too hot to test the car. First task is to assemble all the high-tech equipment to run a supersonic car. The headquarters is a converted supermarket lorry with air conditioning, satellite links and, of course, the basics. Tin tomatoes, bread, eggs, cheese, all the tin fruit that we can eat. Noble has assembled an all-British team of 30, many of whom are taking time off work to share his dream. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be involved in something historic like this. Um, 
I'd do whatever I had to to be here. It's something you can always look back on to and tell your grandchildren or whatever the case. It's, it's a piece of history. Personally, I'm not that interested in land speed records. But a lot of people have said, this isn't possible, it can't be done. And I really like proving people wrong. <laughs> to take the risk of driving his car into the unknown, Noble has chosen RAF fighter pilot Andy Green. It's a world first. It's tremendously exciting to actually be a part of the team that's actually going to go out and do something nobody's ever done before. <laughs> Green fought off 29 other applicants including some of Britain's top test pilots, to win his place as Richard Noble's driver. There was a wonderful moment when I was uh, announced as the driver, and uh, the, uh, Richard gave me this uh, huge great key form with this key dangling on it. And Later on, this, um, one of the spectators there came up and he uh, had his six-year-old son with him and said, can my son have your autograph? And I'd been hanging on to this key because it was the only proof I had this had really happened to me. And I said, well, I can't sign with this in my hand. And I gave it to him and I said, hold this, it's the key to the most powerful car in the world. And he held on to this and he looked up and it was sort of... And there's just look of awe in his face as he looked down at this thing. It was just incredible. And I thought, yeah, that's the power that this project has. Richard Noble was one of Andy Green's heroes. You know, I can remember when uh, Richard Noble broke the world land speed record and I saw it on TV and I read about it in the papers. I thought it was amazing. The incredible part is that Richard, with no preparation at all, got into a jet car, taught himself to drive it, broke the world land speed record. Noble's record of 633 miles per hour, set 15 years ago at the Black Rock Desert, Nevada, has never been beaten. What they discovered later was that if his car had gone just seven miles per hour faster, it would have taken off, and Noble would have been killed. Despite his brush with death, Noble still dreamed of going supersonic. He knew he would need someone to design an extraordinary car. After years of searching, finally in 1992, he ran into Ron Ayres, a retired missile scientist. I said right at the beginning to Richard, this is totally impractical, don't even try it. Ayres had a lifetime's experience working on supersonic missiles and luckily had a love of the land speed record. I only actually carried on working on the project um, more out of curiosity. If sometime some idiot should uh, uh, try to travel supersonically, what should the, uh, uh, the car look like? His revolutionary design was for a 10-ton monster with two jet engines, a long, thin tail, and a radical wheel arrangement. The great danger is, as the car reaches supersonic speeds, it will catastrophically flip into the air. They needed to test the design. First, they spent weeks on computer simulations, checking if their car would stay on the ground. They found a shockwave. A huge wall of energy would build up in front of the car. Although the computer said the car would survive, Ayers demanded a second, more practical test. The second method was to repeatedly blast a rocket-propelled model of the car down a test track at supersonic speeds. Four, three, two, one. Oh. High-speed photography and sensors all over the model should tell them if his design would stay on the ground as it went through the sound barrier. It was a gamble. Only if the detailed results of the computer and the model tests matched exactly would they dare to go ahead and build the car. I can remember very clearly um, plotting the uh, results from the computer analysis against the, uh, the results from the rocket sledge 
and seeing this amazing correlation. It is the one time in my life I have ever shouted Eureka um, because uh, the effect was absolutely dramatic. I really had not expected that uh, uh, two such extraordinary uh, experiments, uh, I, I didn't think either of them could work. The fact that they agreed with each other uh, really implied they had both worked. To build the real car, they needed real jet engines. Luckily, the RAF had a few they no longer needed. This is actually a hell of a moment for us because, of course, as you know, we've been going two and a half years in computer studies and simulations and so on. And now, today, we're actually going to start running the engines, we're going to make a filthy noise, and we're going to see parts of the car work. Going supersonic is not just a question of design. It needs all Richard Noble's wheeler-dealer skills. I believe that the, uh, the government paid something of the order of about one and a half million for each of them. Uh, we paid, well, rather less. <laughs> yeah, we're just uh, winding back down to 80 percent, ready for the, uh, the slam. Roger that. Coming up. The headset on. Okay, we're up to idle now. Two of these huge jet engines together on the car will give it more power than 1,000 family saloons put together. But there was one great obstacle to overcome. With the two massive engines, thrust would weigh 10 tons and need huge metal front wheels. Steering them seemed simply impossible. So wheels and brake designer Glyn Bauscher came up with the car's most extraordinary and controversial feature. I decided that the only sensible thing to do was to steer the rear wheels instead. And it actually solved all the problems. It, it created a set of problems of its own at the back end for steering these wheels. But it solved all the problems with the front wheels. I knew I had to phone up Richard and tell him I'd decided to steer the rear wheels and I was a bit apprehensive as to what he said. Um, I think he mildly swore. <laughs> uh, we did approach uh, various learned professors and I had some extremely hostile uh, reactions to it because they simply said it wouldn't work. Almost in, say, in desperation, but as a last resort, we, I, I, I felt that we had to build some kind of a demonstration vehicle and drive it at speed and steer by the rear wheels and not the front. So my brother-in-law and myself built the rear wheel steered Mini uh, based on his old Mini, 30 years old, and we built it such that the wheel plan form of the Mini is a proper scaled version of the full-size jet car. It corners quite well. This is the final revolutionary layout of the wheels. Two widely spaced at the front and two close together at the back but with one slightly in front of the other to squeeze them into the narrow tail of the finished car. Now, at long last, they're in Jordan to test the Thrust SSC supersonic car for real. I designed it uh, purely functionally, although many people have said that uh, um, it looks nice. Uh, one young lady did accuse me of de designing the ultimate um, male sex symbol. <laughs> But, um, uh, no, it's just you know, literally the shape is to keep it on the ground. That's the, 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 the it's designed specifically for stability. We've tried to make this the absolutely perfect project. We did two and a half years of research, and, of course, we got very, very good results. The question, of course, in everybody's mind is, are the results going to be credible when we actually get here? Is the full-scale car going to behave as the research model behaved? If it doesn't behave like the research model, what on earth do we do? It's highly dangerous. They'll need weeks of runs to inch their way towards their present target of 600 miles an hour. For their first run, they plan to go a mere 140. North Team SSC, request on the parachutes. All 
stations, SSC is armed. For the video, run 25, looking for 110 mile an hour peak indicated, and then braking point 25 at G2, a stop, Max Mill. SSC, you're clear to roll. You are clear to roll. Yeah. The big question in everyone's mind is will the rear wheel steering work as the speeds go up? Negative. By the time we play with the car, it's going to be too hot. Roger. Even at these low speeds, Noble is worried. He goes to look at the tracks the car has left on the desert. Well, what's actually happened is we aren't going very fast. We're going about 100, 110 miles an hour. And um, you can see that something has happened to the surface here. You see there's a very slight sort of um, uh, convex bulge there, very, very slight. And it's only a matter of a, an inch or so. And what has happened is the car's come across this and it's taken off from about the front wheels here, taken off from about there, and they've started to land somewhere about here. So it's about a, a sort of, um, there's a, something like a sort of six foot distance where the, where the wheel has flown. And it's not very high, I mean, it's um, maybe, you know, a few millimetres off the deck. That's actually what's happened. And with a car that's rear wheel steer, it depends on its front wheels to actually get um, good lateral grip that way. So if the front wheels aren't, are in the air, then you've lost out on your grip. There are six cameras on board the car to record every aspect of each run. And there's bad news from the camera looking at one of the rear wheels. The bumps on the surface of the desert are making the rear wheels twist. If they reach 600 miles per hour, it could be fatal. We've got a little bit cross because it's happened. Um, Mm, a little bit angry, but that's not a bad thing because we, we want it to work. And if it if it didn't have if it didn't have emotion in it, then it wouldn't be worth doing. When workshop manager Nick Dove examines the rear wheels themselves, things look even worse. We've got a bit of a problem with the steering at the moment. As you can say, we've got a bit of wheel play going like that. Oh my God! It shouldn't be like that. So uh, we've got to investigate. So. Chances are running tomorrow are pretty slim. In fact, chances of running this week could be pretty slim. It can be quite serious, yeah. When you drive your own car, you've probably got some movement in your wheels. Even though your, your, your steering wheel is held stationary, it allows them to move. I think if, if the movement was smaller, I wouldn't be particularly bothered about it, but it's perhaps a bit bigger than I would like. I hope it's a quick and easy job. Don't know. Don't know. It's a bit of a nightmare, really. Is you actually steer? That's real and not noise then. It's not noise. It's real because it's coincident with the bumps. The car has two onboard computers that record every move it makes in extraordinary detail. Using the results, they can try modifications. They come up with a possible solution. However, those events are very, very quick. We fitted uh, steering dampers on both wheels to stop, stop the. Uh, there's all quick movement of the wheel when it hits the lumps in the desert. We'll soon find out, out to do a, the same run as uh, Monday and look at the video evidence after and to see what, what happened. Do you think you can manage to do the same profile again? What, including all the weaving about? Oh, please, yeah. yeah okay, exactly the same yeah. track. Right. Yeah. We'll, try to, we'll try to find you a dead piece of desert with the same lumps in as well. Right. Yeah. SSC is ready to roll. Roger, SSC, engine start. Roll SSC, North Team chops away. Andy Green tries the modified SSC once again at just 140 miles per hour. Thank you, SSC rolling. Car starts to creep forward. And now both up to 79%. Left is just slow to catch up. In about 30 miles an hour. Pushing the power up 25%.
the car performs much better, and Green can now take the speed up. But first, he would need to paint himself a racetrack. Being out in the desert is like being out in the open sea. There are no features at all. Uh, it's the reason we come here. It's perfectly flat, it's perfectly featureless. There's nothing out here for 10 miles. The car leaves ruts in the desert. We can't run over its old ruts. So we have to have a series of parallel lines in the desert. We put them 50 feet apart simply to give us a clear track each time. What I need is then uh, 10 miles of straight white line and then 50 foot across another perfectly parallel, perfectly straight 10 miles of uh, white line. And that's really what we're doing at the moment is actually trying to paint a perfectly straight 10 mile white line, which sounds quite easy until you actually try and drive dead straight for more than about 50 feet at a time. It gets very difficult, especially when you've got nothing to follow. Along each 10 mile track, every loose object which could damage the wheels or go through the engines has to be picked up by hand. It's known as fodding, another job for the loyal supporters. We're here for dining, but um, it's also my fortnight's holiday from summer holiday from work, and uh, it's a lovely way to spend it because you get plenty of sunshine. We're back on about six, are we tonight? Yeah, yeah. Before it gets dark. It's a good fire, is that, Ken? Yes, I don't know that problem. I'm a good firemaker. Well, I've got the wood. Bloody back wood. to the grindstone on Monday, Tuesday. Bank holiday in. Oh. Uh, last night on the prairie, my son. Oh, last night. It should be champagne, this really. Well, it's beer though, if you want it. Have some beer for If you're not a Muslim, you can have some. No, I'll have some for later. That'll be better. Day by day, the temperatures are rising. The next morning, computer man Jerry Bliss discovers the heat is an even bigger problem than they had feared. One of the onboard computers, Comp 2, has failed. They won't be going faster today. This Comp 2 is, is seriously damaged by the heat, in as much as... Uh, Gets damaged or is damaged. ...is damaged the heat. It, it appears that uh, we've dropped out two power supplies which are rated to drop out of 100 degrees centigrade, which means that inside the bay it's getting close to or at 100 degrees centigrade. So we may be down to just today, we may be down for three days. Okay. Such is life. Mm. The first run we did, we were late getting out and we didn't run until midday. The temperatures were enormous then. We are, however, always out here at four o'clock in the morning, as you well know. <laughs> and um, what we're trying to do now is, as soon as there's sufficient light, we'll run for our, we'll, we'll start rolling to the start. So we're ready to start as soon as possible. Still, the temperature rises and time is running out. While they struggle to repair the damage on the car, they attempt to repair the desert by simply filling in dips and holes. The weather is unbearable. I was out this morning, out in Andrews, doing the uh, tracks and everything, laying the tracks. I couldn't have stuck it out there much longer. We had to come in. I mean, the midday heat here is, I mean, it's, it's well, well, 125, I think, someone recorded this morning, and it's unbearable. You're just cooking out there. You've got to come in and get away from it. Just drink loads of liquids. Dawn. And finally, Thrust is ready to run at speed. The whole team prepare. On a run day, we get out of bed at 3 o'clock. <laughs> Dark. No different than getting up at five o'clock, basically. I mean, cause once you, you're awake and you're out of bed, it's just a normal day. I get really nervous as soon as they say over the radio, you hear SSC ready to roll. It's like. SSC, <gasps> the vehicles are clear in the area. You have one shot on the right wheel. Once you've seen it once, you just can't. You never get sick of it. You never get sick of seeing it. And once it runs in the desert, well, that's. It's just incredible. It's an amazing place, an amazing thing to do. Mill power, 120. A little bit of fish turning at the back, settling down, 175. Peak at 196. Feels awfully quick. She's so beautiful. I mean, the car's lovely. 
Fresh school goosey pimples. <laughs> Look, I've gone goosey pimples now. That's beautiful, Carl. And we're going to do it if we have to push it. 250, drifting left very slightly. The speed rises to 300 miles per hour. But at this speed, steering becomes a problem. Carl doesn't want to correct for some reason. Hey, can you pull the protects, please, Robert? Yeah, put them. Yeah. Take, take Merlin, them out. Merlin, Merlin, back at your location. Just thought you were gonna... Good feel, Andy. Didn't correct as quickly as I was hoping, oh, but I'm being very gently with it. To the left at, yeah, uh, and I put in points. about 40 degrees of steering input and it just sat there. There's still a question mark there, um, and it took a long time to actually recover. He drifted to the left of track, and then he applied a steering correction to come back onto the right, but it didn't appear to happen immediately. The question is, why didn't that happen? No one knows how serious a problem this is. The theory is, with its huge aerodynamic tail, the faster the car goes, the straighter it will run. They decide that tomorrow, they'll go even faster and see what happens. I mean, every day we're moving into the big unknown, aren't we? So, I mean, we, we, we've got to expect problems all the time, I think. If we don't get a problem, we've had a result. Taxman's taken all my dough. He's left me in my... This is the boys' life. They get good food all the and they do like... They call it junk food. Chips. They do love their chips. Please confirm, A, that you've got the, the facts and it's come through all right. All I've got is this sunny Lamb or the other one? Lamb or the it's other one? It's not beef. You've probably seen the front page of the Independent. Apparently, we have a major picture there. Oh, the Today, Andy Green is aiming for 400 miles per hour. Way off the line, not a very good one. That was a cyst dump. Cyst pressure still looks good. Three and a half to go, three and a half to go. Late on the chute, and it's still wobbly as fuck. A lot of dust in the cockpit. Oil, shut the engines down at 100. Breaking half. He's reached 410 miles an hour. But going faster hasn't solved the steering problem. I'm having to put massive corrections into the steering to keep the car going in a straight line. Every time I stop giving it this, the car just and it goes. It is unstable. Okay. It's just the rate and number of steering yes, inputs indeed. is yeah, a lot. I appreciate that. I appreciate so apologies for drawing wiggly lines 10 or 15 feet off the white line. That, at the moment, is the best I can achieve given the, the, the workload in the cockpit. What about aerodynamics then? I, I will get be better in by now? as right. I get more oh, used to the right. profiles, as I get more used to the steering. Right. But it is very hard work. We always knew that rear wheel steering was going to be difficult to achieve. We're the first people ever to do this. We've been to the best uh, in Britain, and they've half of them said it can't be done, simply because it hasn't been done before. We've taken the approach that, a bit like going supersonic on land in a car, just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean to say we can't do it. I do feel a lot of pressure. Uh, when things don't go quite right and there's question marks, then it's, it's sheer pressure because uh, it was my idea and uh, I stand by it. There's nobody else to blame, just me. <laughs> when they inspect the car, they find a part of the rear suspension has broken, but no one knows why. A new piece will have to be made. It's yet another delay. It's like this. But what has damaged the car? Designers Glyn Bauscher and Ron Ayres search the wheel tracks for clues. 
So if there's something breaks on this, it's really an accumulation. I mean, this is this is huge. Look at the look at the distance up there before his keels come down again. Yeah. This is a monster. <laughs> this is really interesting. You've kind of got some rear wheel tracks here, very briefly, and the front there. Then there's a space there of something nearly four, 35 feet away before there's any more contact. And the car was actually completely airborne here. It's got no contact with the ground whatsoever. All four wheels are off the deck. The car, when Glyn and I, four and a half years ago, started designing it, was aimed at Black Rock Desert in Nevada, <coughs> which is a softer surface and a smoother surface. Um, we've done a lot of adapting to the design to make it cope with this surface. Um, if we'd known it was going to be like this, well, then perhaps we would have designed it differently from scratch anyway. Despite the steering problems and fears that the rough desert may destroy the car, the team are determined to push on. Today, they hope to reach 500 miles per hour for the first time. They're going into the unknown. It's now not just about research. There's much more at stake. Everybody in the team is responsible for his life. Because if anything does go wrong, how do you think the rest of us are going to feel? Because we've all had something to do with it. No one can afford to make any, any mistakes in cock-ups. Now focus. Looking for max. 220. Shitload of dust coming from the right-hand side. 300. Sweet steering. Max burner. 450, drifting left, ignoring that. 500 indicated. Now getting back to the right-hand side. That was the mile four tracks, not totally surprised. Go. 430, copied. Fucking great dust storm in the cockpit. Looking Suddenly, at 540 miles per hour, Green struggles to control the car. Come on, asshole. Stop babbling the stick. Looking for brakes. Something has gone terribly wrong. Shut down, very bumpy at this stage. 1.1 to go. Oh dear. Anyone a member of the AA? I think we might need recovery. 60 miles an hour short of their goal, there's been a major suspension failure. On both wheels, a main mounting has broken. Shit out of work now. Leg out, isn't it? Go on. I'm inclined to agree. Sorry, which ones are these? Top mount. The top mount of the LDVT? No, top mount. Have you seen it? On the other side? No, this here. Have you seen it? See what the bridge needs to join on to? Oh, yeah. Oh, right. Went straight through, isn't it? Well, I hadn't realised that. Mm. Yes, that's serious. And my handy were is ruined by one bit of hard desert. It could take many days to repair. They've been here three weeks, and time has almost run out. Noble knows going home with a broken car would be a PR disaster. The battle with Craig Breedlove at Black Rock Desert could be off. So, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter about me. You have just two de decisions. Either fix it here or go home. Yeah? That's all you've got to do. If you can fix it here, then we must fix it here. Yeah, but you're part of the loop, because you have to decide how long we can stay. I'll keep you going. You get right, fixed. I know you will, but uh, let's... So, I, that's what you have to do. I mean, you have to really look at the situation here. Mm. Are we into a, a, a situation where we're three weeks' work or something to get it straight again? Or, um, or in which case, that's oh, a serious no. problem. It's passive displacement. This is nice and clean. So suddenly, it takes all away and drops down. Yeah. Front went first, then the rear. That's even more scary then. Um, we, know we, we, know we, know, we know we got steering difficulties at the moment, not difficulties, problems, which we uh, have drawn to rectify. Oh, which it's just going a bit too far ahead, that is Nick, to be honest. No, <laughs> hear me out then. Why don't you, <laughs> straight away, why don't you just go get it all ready for Blackrock? 
do all the work at the same time. <clears throat> I fully understand what you're saying, and I don't disagree with you. Blackrock's better surface. Yes, I know. But the difficulty is that if we go back here with an incl inconclusive result, you may not have the money to go to Blackrock anyway. That is not the what That's we're here are talking about. Mm. We're talking about design meetings, we're not talking about mm. money. Richard says you either, t is, you either fix it here mm. in a couple of weeks, or a week or so, or you go back to England. That's, that's the issue. Well, the question is, we've got to give him the options. Yeah, that's right. If he wants an answer, which way we go? He wants an answer, that's all. Okay. Back to England or stay here and repair it. And we've got to decide that. So what I'm saying, go back to England and repair <coughs> it properly. This is important. It's very important. But I still want to go back and assess all the work. Absolutely. Right. The thing is that we, Nick and myself, have done a bit of an assessment on this, on the time it would take. Um, it's going to take a minimum of two weeks, somewhere between two and three weeks, to get the whole job done and, and get back on the desert again. Is that a feasible proposition or not? Well, I'll put it to Richard, but I think you've almost guessed the I, answer already. Yeah. The fundamental trap is that we haven't achieved the 600 miles now we said we were going to do, and we're coming back with a broken car. That's not good. Um, we've then got an enormous uphill climb now to make the money to go to Blackrock. I mean, frankly, we're more or less out of money, so we've got to start again. Um, also, we're seeing cutbacks in sponsorship budgets and so on, so it's, it's, going, to be, uh, it's going to be a very, very hard grind. I made it very clear to them, and they're all saying, well, come on, Richard, cheer up. Come on, that's your, not your normal self. And I'm saying, you guys have just got to understand just what we're up against. That's the way it goes. For his supersonic dream to come true, they'll have to return home, mend the car, and raise money by any means they can. What we'd like to do now is introduce an element of excitement into the, into the afternoon. What we're going to do is we're going to auction a number of used parts from Thrust SSC. Afternoon, everyone. Are you enjoying yourselves? Richard Noble's thrust supersonic car is back on the road. It failed at 540 miles an hour on its trials in Jordan, but now rebuilt, the British team hope it's ready for its moment of history to break the sound barrier. Noble has brought his 10-ton monster to the Black Rock Desert, Nevada, where he set his own record in 1983. But the rains that flood the desert will be coming soon. Noble has just weeks to achieve his dream. The whole idea started in 1990, and it's an absolutely terrific moment now we're actually going to go out and run. And this is a surface, of course, that the car was always designed for. It was never designed for the hard, rough surface of, uh, of Jordan. So we're going to find out just how good it really is. <laughs> Squadron leader Andy Green is the man chosen to drive the car. First, he'll try to beat Noble's 15-year record before attempting the ultimate, the sound barrier. It's tremendously exciting to actually be a part of the team that's actually going to go out and do something nobody's ever done before. 
it's a world first. We actually climb the mountain, if you like, you know, the world's highest mountain, the, the ultimate in land speed record break, uh, and achieve a genuine world first that, for all of us, is going to be you know, one of the highlights of our lives. On the other side of the desert, the British team have a rival. American Craig Breedlove has won and lost the record five times. Now, 60 years old, he's determined to be the first man through the sound barrier. A year ago, he reached an unofficial 670 miles an hour, but then his car seemed to take off and careered wildly off course. Nearing the speed of sound, it's keeping the car on the ground that is the toughest challenge. God almighty. The nearby town of Gerlach has only one motel. But after their poor result in Jordan, the thrust team can't afford to stay in it. So they rented a collection of empty houses with mattresses thrown on the floor. Sense of humor time, guys. Don't forget to shut the gate behind you now. Yeah. Oh, boy. Americans live like this. Well. With the base camp assembled, they're now ready to push thrust to the extreme. Morning. Computer simulations have shown that as it nears the speed of sound, a shockwave will build up. A huge wall of energy which threatens to lift the nose and make thrust take off. So a computerized active suspension has been designed by Jerry Bliss. It should lift the rear of the car as it nears supersonic speeds, tipping it forward and holding it on the ground. Estimated start time 7.50 to be on the uh, start line with 10 minute warning to start engines. Any it's the final briefing for the team of 40. Squadron leader Jane Millington is in charge of communications. She's also Andy Green's girlfriend. As he dices with death, she'll be the only person talking to him in the cockpit of the car. And you're advised that all inappropriate flight behavior will be cited to the FAA and Bureau of Land Management. Thrust pit station operating as Kilo Charlie Foxtrot 6 out. Two microlights check the desert is clear and safe to run. Is Andy the right man for this job? Oh yes, I always thought he was going to be. Uh, I knew he was right the minute we saw the uh, Richard's little uh, understated advertisement for the driver. Because he's very cool, he's very competent, very capable. Cool, competent, capable, calm. Yeah, I suppose to me he's stayed sober, studious and serious. <laughs> Anyway, no, he's definitely the right man, and as the time has gone on, he actually drives the car exceptionally well. It's a very complicated beast. It is not a simple matter of putting anybody in there and just going for it. He knows the systems inside out. He controls the vehicle immensely well, and um, I've got no doubts about him. Never had. Just be ready to roll. SC, clear to roll. All stations, SSC, rolling. <laughs> 100, 150, up to 400 for the active, 410 throttle back, hold at 420 until 4 miles to go, throttle back 350 for the parachute, 150 for the brakes, 100 to engine shutdown, let's go and do it. There will be many runs, each one at faster and faster speeds. 250, 5.6, waiting for the active to cycle, throttling back. This time, it's 500 miles an hour. The car runs well. Looking for 350. Four to go. Top four to go. Four to go. Shoot one, shoot one. Shoot out. Shoot feels nice. Fits us to see the car is stopped. I see, copy. The car has stopped. With the battle on, Andy Green sets off to size up his rival. That's what I'd like to do. Craig, have you met Andy? No, I haven't. Hi, Hi. Hi. Tell me was here. Andy. Andy Good being here, Andy. It's very nice to meet you. Yeah. Well, you're a big strapping. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Lucky for us, I got a big car. As well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> very, very nice to meet you, Andy. Isn't this a great surface to run on? Oh, it's wonderful. You can't believe it. Man. Well, did you see the car yet? No, not yet. Oh, well, it's come over. Great, thank you. Hey, what a guy! Breedlove's car is far more conventional than Thrust. It has just one jet, steers with the front wheels, and has conventional suspension. One thing certain Andy couldn't get in that one. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no fear of that. So he's not going to run off with it one night, great. No, there's definitely no chance of me driving it. How do you get into this? Wow. Beautiful, beautiful looking machine. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly what I was expecting. A lovely, lovely looking car. You know, superb piece of engineering. Uh, it's a, no way I could drive it. The cockpit is absolutely tiny. But uh, again, designed around the man. So it's a very, very well designed car. I was very impressed. You know, I, I wish him the very best because the last time he drove it uh, was the fastest crash in land speed record history. He's a big threat to our whole objective in as much that his experience is huge, really. I mean, you can't deny that. First of all, five and six hundred. He wants seven hundred. He's an older man, not dare I say, as calm, cool and collected as Andy. He's a little bit more of a flamboyant character. And so, I mean, he could be going out for a 600 mile an hour run and decide 700 to do me, buff. That's the danger. To reach supersonic speeds above 760 miles an hour, they'll need a series of 13 mile tracks, which means very long straight white lines to follow. Good old turn. While for some, there's a 13-mile hike searching for fod. Basically, we're fodding, which is looking for pieces of stone which actually create, you know, could create damage. So they call it foreign object damage, so it's called fodding. That's short for foreign object damage. Um, they can either get sucked into the engine and damage the engine, or they could actually damage the wheels. We're trying to get 13 miles fodded for today because obviously the car can't run unless the track has been fodded. Is it an enjoyable job? <laughs> fodding, the dreadful fodding. No, it's, it's OK, actually. It's not bad. It's quite therapeutic, really, once you get into a rhythm. <laughs> it's only safe for one car to race at a time. First off today is Breedlove. Yeah. On the surrounding hills, the speed freaks are gathering in their mobile homes. Breedlove did 328 and he's going to run the car back. Oh, yes. Oh, oh great. Yes. 328. Oh, my goodness. Sake. I don't think they're going to make their one hour turnaround, do you? No, I don't think so either. The car is meant to return even faster. But the wait seems far longer than usual. When it finally appears, it's being towed. Something has gone wrong. Someone has missed a piece of desert fod. It's been sucked into the air intakes and hit the engine. Mr. Breedlove, is it right you have some engine problems? Uh, yeah. What, what, what's happened? Well, we got fod damage on our uh, uh, last uh, run, so uh, we have to go home and, and put another engine in. Oh. So we're on the way. <laughs> I'm very, very sorry for him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> gives us a window, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it would be We can get, we get our tracks clear now and fodder and everything. Get ready. Just because it happened to one car means it could happen to another car, so we're being very, very careful at the moment to check the surface. There are very few stones out here, but every single inch of track, and I'm doing a mile every six seconds. Yesterday, people were taking an hour to walk that mile to pick up the stones on there. So six seconds of track takes an hour to clear to make sure there are no stones and we're not going to damage our engines. The station SSC ready to roll. SSC clear to roll. All stations, SSC rolling. 10.7 speed, Reed's looking for me. Looking for me in Burnham. 
That's good, Minberna. Looking for Max. Today should be their first run over 600 miles per hour, using the full power of the afterburners, which guzzle fuel at four gallons a second. 450. Looking for 550. 500. Using it back. But at 624 miles an hour, one of the computers which control the car suddenly crashes. Ah, pump shut down, we've got a problem here. Abort. Indications are that Comp 1 is down. I say again, indications Comp 1 is down. 56 degrees right hand steering. For Andy Green, it's back to HQ to review the tapes with squadron leader Jane Millington. What made me say Comp 1's gone down? They try to figure out why the computer has crashed but no one can find the answer. Wait, what made me diagnose it's COP1 there? Uh, pit station SSC require telemetry's attention at the earliest available. In town, the Black Rock Saloon is keeping score. The British are drawing further ahead. Rock and out board, clear to roll. Rock and roll, SSC. Bricks off. All stations, SSC is rolling. The next day is the same story. Another computer crash. Whoa! Yeah. SSC is shut down with an abort fire. Uncommanded. Andy just uh, radioed that SSC is aborted at uh, mile uh, four. I literally just heard that uh, we're towing back, that the second one's been cancelled. Fitz SSC, the car is stopped. SC copied, car has stopped. All stations, the car has stopped. No, it's crashed. <laughs> Thank you. I don't give up. Just try something what? different. I've tried everything. I cannot make it fail. It's a fucking workshop. Yeah. It only fails. That's got, to be, it's got to be something we're not doing in the workshop, though. Something we're not simulating. Top one is down again. Which means we can't run. We've got to get it fixed. So we're going back in again? Yeah. Pain in the arse. Yes. There is, unfortunately, an intermittent fault on one of the onboard computers. It shuts itself down at about the same speed every time, at about 540 miles an hour. It seems to shut itself down. If the computer shuts down, it goes into fail-safe mode and shuts the car down effectively. Although time is tight, the car goes into the workshop for a complete overhaul. The team are growing weary. A couple of volunteers for tonight for the uh, night shift. Who ain't done it yet? Who has not done night shift? Yeah. Well, I'm having a day off tomorrow, my kids, and I'm going to have a day off tomorrow, and anyone else wants a day off, they have a day off tomorrow. But, okay, what Noble says or anyone says, everyone's getting tired, and I want to start fresh on a new day. Bring it with Nick, I want a day off. A little toss for telling Richard. Yes. Well, I'll just tell him the rain Thursday. Because that's the easy bit. It's the next 10 seconds that are difficult. <laughs> Although Gerlach has only 350 inhabitants, it has five bars. The team have made the Black Rock Saloon their unofficial headquarters. Bored. <laughs> Not bored at all. There's a lot to live life pleasantly. Live this life of luxury. People. I think the Americans need a, need a little lesson in etiquette. <laughs> well, this is all we do, actually, isn't it, really? We just eat and sleep and, and um, do this thrust thing on the desert, really. We have a little drink, but then that helps you sleep at night. You have to have a little nightcap. 
Now, several days of dust storms add to the delays. Right, and finally, we do have a strong weather warning for this oh, afternoon. I'm not sure how it came in, but it arrived this morning. <coughs> Winds are 35 mile an hour, uh, stronger than uh, last night. For Noble, it's even worse. Time is money. This is just no joke. We have been um, over half a million in the red. Uh, there's nobody there to bail us out except my house, and my house isn't worth that. Um, so, you know, you're on the verge of bankruptcy most of the time. That's the only way in which you can keep this project going. You, you, you have to take calculated risks, just as Andy takes the driving, calculated driving risks, and I take the calculated financial risks. There's currently zero visibility in dust. Return with extreme caution. The dust storms are seriously slowing down work on the car. I'm a day lost, though. Can't beat the weather, can you? Oh, so we're not running, eh? Hey? We're not running. No. Doesn't look like it. Well, she's got a sail for it. We're rolling. It's a week since Thrust last ran. The American breed love is back but he's having a series of terrible problems. He's out of the race. Thrust will finally be ready in late afternoon. Only time for a one-way run. The team aren't keen to do it. Noble isn't happy. Uh, very soon, we're gonna find ourselves in a situation where our productivity is gonna be absolutely appalling. And I think we've gotta take hold of this right now. What? can we achieve today that we can't achieve tomorrow with a pair of runs? The problem is it's really the attitude, which is the jam tomorrow attitude. We have to grab opportunities as, as and when they come and make use of them. That's how I feel. There is no opportunity now. There is a run today. We've got a 12-mile tow back because we can run once. Yeah. And then we have a 12-mile tow back followed by serious checks of the car, which means we won't be finished until 9 or 10 this evening. If we're not finished till 9 or 10 this evening, you then get the team up at 5 a.m. Mm. to come out here and no, do a pair of runs in the morning. I'm sorry, but no way. Sorry. We've got to get ourselves into a situation where we do, um, w when we get any kind of bite, any kind of opportunity, we go for those two runs and we do them. We are. We, well, no, one, well, no one's arguing against that. I mean, you know. Richard, no one's arguing against that. No, I'm, okay, can do but it. I mean, we've really, we've really got to do it. Look at the runs we've done already. Now we've had a major rework, there's no reason why we can't just progress at the next rate again now. But to do it this afternoon is, is foolhardy, I think. Okay, anyway. okay. okay. Well, okay. You're trying to get us to do Richard, it. if you want to do three runs the next two days, we'll do them all three tomorrow. Three runs tomorrow? Yeah. That's right. Lock possibly, possibly even four. So why don't we get ourselves geared up between this little group here and say, right, we're going to do four tomorrow. I really, really see what we can do. Tomorrow, they're hoping the computer will work. They think the chips have been shaken out of their sockets. They fix them in tighter. Well, it's got to come up a ton, I think. The official timers are setting up on the course. Today, Andy Green will try to break Richard Noble's record of 633. Andy must make two runs within one hour through a measured mile. If he does, it will be a major step on the way to the sound barrier. Uh, we probably ought to leave it alone before we screw it up. I think it's fine. It's working. Okay. Parachute arm, bolt armed. In your own time, you clear data, unplug, panel up, and chops away. Safe journey. Bye. When the car runs, I actually feel physically ill because I'm sitting there thinking 11 tons of metal, 100,000 odd horsepower, and it's about to course across the ground at an enormous rate of knots. And all I can sit there is think about 10,000 different things that could possibly go wrong. But we don't crash. It actually physically affects me. The fleeting, which is a nice change. Five seventy. Car swing about a bit. Some dust coming in now. Six thirty. Six fifty. Looking for five point five. Stop it. Idle. That's oh, shit. On the old tracks. Looking at shoot one. Nothing on shoot one. Looking at shoot two. 
The computer works, but both of the braking parachutes have failed. There'll be no second run and no record today. Two miles to go, 400 miles an hour. Recovery, be advised. SSC, double shoot failure. Double shoot failure. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, I'm afraid that's it. Um, something has gone wrong. But that run was very fast. Did I hear that right? Did, <laughs> did I Seven, hear... 721 <laughs> 721. Mm. Beautiful. Oh. No shoot. Yeah. What happened today, four times, was that instead of said small parachute coming out, which it did, and dragging the rest of it out, it got to the end and uh, just carried on going. But it didn't take the parachute pack with it. Therefore, we didn't have a deployment. Therefore, Andy didn't slow down. So he fired one fired the other one and they both did exactly the same thing. The problem we have here is that a lot of the gear that we're using is X Thrust 2. Yeah. And even when it was used in Thrust 2 it was second hand. The first rains have come. But the desert dries quickly enough for another attempt on the record. Which may result in a new land speed record. This may be Noble's last day as the fastest man on earth. And hopefully we'll have a few beers tonight. <laughs> but there was a threat last year when we were in Jordan and it looked like Craig was going to go and beat his record and he said to me, he said, will you still love me if I'm not the fastest man in the world? And I said, well, I loved you before you were the fastest man in the world, so yeah, I think I will. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to do it today, and that's it. Got to get it in the bag and then get on with the job in hand, and that's it. Pit station, this is USAC timing. USAC timing, and pit station is ready to copy and read back. Go ahead. The mile, seven, zero, zero. The first run is easily fast enough, but to get a new record, they have to turn the car round in the hour. They load a ton of fuel and check every part of the car to see it's safe. They make it with just minutes to spare. Pitch station, this is USAC timing. Ready to copy and read back. The mile, seven, two, eight, point, zero. Andy Green is now officially the fastest man on earth. The average of the two runs and his new world record is 714 miles per hour. I'm so happy. <laughs> but in a kind of British understated sort of way. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, it's your own record that's gone. Any, any sort of feelings of sadness? No, I've been working for six years to get rid of it. <laughs> At the Black Rock Saloon, there's time to celebrate before the real battle begins to beat the sound barrier. I'm going to size that thing. Did you not bubble when you see it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the British team, they, they all go to bed early, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't tell by me, I can tell you that. No, as a matter of fact, there's sort of a late night crew. The Americans are in bed by like, I don't know, seven or eight o'clock. They listen to the weather and they go to bed. The Brits, they stay up all night. But. That's probably why they're beating us, you know? That's probably why, you know? I'm a Brit now, you know? I change my nationality. 
And that's not just because they're kicking our butt. <laughs> hey, how come you're not bartending? I thought I'd put my silly hat on for you. <laughs> Hi to my auntie in Potter's Bar. A microlight pilot has taken pictures of the effect these huge speeds are having. A shockwave, a wall of energy building up in front of the car, and it's starting to make the car lift at the front. This phenomenon is, is totally unique, and I don't think anyone has ever seen anything like it. That is enormous. I want a copy of that. The effects on the body are punishing. A panel has blown off at over 700 miles per hour. Are still attached. It's only the rivets. In fact. Excuse my ignorance. The, the rivets that we're using, do we have anything stronger available? No. They we are. tried to get cherry max, but there were thousands and thousands of pounds that we could get them. OK, I think we've all got the message that now it is totally unforgiving. We do not um, take any shortcuts. We've seen what happens if uh, something is not on right. If it means we delay a run, we delay a run. That's why it's got to be. It's now just too dangerous to do anything else. Then Green has a radical idea. We're going to need the tail to run fully up. You can, you can see the download falling off. Well, uh, I, will, I will draw you back to uh, Mr. Duffs. If we do that, then it's a major redesign and we don't run again this year. Hear me out, hear me out. How about running the car with, in, it, in the uh, abort position? He suggests doing away with Jerry Bliss's computerized active suspension, which raises the tail at speed. Andy Green wants it locked permanently at the maximum height, which will keep the nose pushed down and make sure the car doesn't take off. From what we've seen, we don't need to drop the tail to accelerate through that. We've got the power to get past that bit. We'll just run the tail. I refer you to my previous answer. Do what you fucking like, because I don't care anymore. So, Andy, are you proposing to run with your board fully open? despite the fact that I am quite cross about the thing and the way it was done. Uh, I don't believe it is unsafe, and so as far as I'm concerned, if that's what is wanted, then we'll do it that way, and I'm just going to have to deal with the fact that I'm pissed off about it. That's my problem, not anybody else's. Time to test Andy Green's theory, with the rear suspension fixed in the up position. Now let's see what's going to happen to the car. Drifting right his head. Gently with the controls, 350. 580, a little bit of a yaw there. Jesus. Shoot one. The car suddenly veers off course and Green immediately fires the parachute. It's back to the tapes. So it's just after the shockwave's for 580, 590 when you get the shock over the, uh, the canopy where it suddenly went kick left. With the tail locked up, the massive front wheels have dug into the desert, making Green lose control. 500. <laughs> it's gone there. God, look at it. Going right down. Oh, look, that's just there. It goes. That's where we lose it. They decide to compromise and use partly active suspension. I suggest we just found the strength limit of the Black Rock Desert with these wheels. Driving that car is not an easy undertaking at all. Um, Andy won't tell you that, but he's really been fighting that thing right the way down the line. It's a tremendous personal achievement from his point of view, absolutely tremendous personal achievement. But nevertheless, um, you know, the, the worry of the thing is, is very considerable. It weighs on us all. We have had reports of rain on the measured mile area of the track. We intend to uh, view this rain, which is uh, for the next 30 minutes, 
It is believed that the rain will clear uh, as, uh, within this 30 minutes. I will make an assessment whether it is possible to run uh, at the end of this time. We will monitor this rain for the next three or zero minutes. We anticipate and hope that this rain will clear. The sky certainly looks brighter from the direction of clearing. The weather we is worsening and the car is aging very fast. Just here, we've got, we've got a, a, a prep starting. So we stopped drilled him, and the last one, they haven't gone any further. So he's got to look at these panels every turn round and make sure that no rivets pop and they sort of stay bonded. This is the implications so if you're losing the panel, the air going through at sort of like 700 mile an hour, will it sort of like go into the rear bays and explode the other panels off? He's exceptionally domesticated. He does an exceptionally good job of morning dishes. Pretty handy around the house, dries quite quickly, but no one's perfect. <laughs> oh, we want to run now, but we can't. I mean, what if it rains tomorrow and rains the next day and we can't run at all, then we've blown it. Mm. That's the worst part. But it doesn't rain, it snows. And in the freezing temperatures, the track isn't drying. No one knows if it's safe to run. Get down to the edge. This is the point where the car hits uh, peak dynamic load and gets it most unstable. And we've never run on this surface before. And we could try it, and it might be fine. We could try it, lose control. And I don't know what the answer is. Mm. What is this going to do when it's taking six or seven tonnes per wheel of load? Because yeah, you never experienced know. that, you know? No, I don't know. Your, your well, peak load on, was about had... three and a half tonnes of wheels, wasn't it? Yes, but then um, we had narrow wheels, too. Is it going to affect the stability of the car at all? It's very difficult to say. You could can, can almost say that that would give you a bit more compliance in the surface, mm. and it might make it a little bit gibby. Um, Which but may make it supported. better or may make it worse. I, I can't say. Exactly. I can't say. Now, given we are on the ragged edge of stability, mm. my feeling, and that's basically what it comes down to, my feeling is that we don't press a, what is potentially a bad situation. Well, it is a bad situation. It's also it's on the ragged edge of stability at 600. Yeah, but it's also a question of what speed you'd be doing when you get onto this. The question for me is, what happens if you can compress it? Yeah, sure, but the load bearing is fine. But bloody hell, you can run something on there. Based on the previous experience, I'd have said this was good to run on, but if you're not mm. happy, then that's the end of it. Mm. Yeah, but Richard uh, never lost control at 600 miles an hour. I have once. In fact, I have twice. I've got it back once. Okay. Yeah, this is a 540 point. When well, it's 550 indicated 600 yeah. actual. Yeah. yeah, when it does, when it tends to do that. Yeah. And, and if one of the wheels is in a soft patch at the time, at the time it will be irrecoverable. Mm. And then we might have a, a ruined car as well. Mm. Which would be bad. Which would be very bad. <laughs> yes. OK, well, basically, that's it. Um, but tomorrow, we're going to have to get on with it. Time's running out, weather's well, running out, money's running out, everything's running yeah, out. Yeah, we need to press ourselves. People are running out. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've got tomorrow. Mm. Hello, Mum, it's me. Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Hey, look, get watching the telly. We're going to go out and try and break the sound barrier. A C cleared to roll. All stations, SSC rolling. Cobb with that, all vehicles. Stationary, stationary, stationary. SSC is rolling. Didn't get it. Looking for it again. Sort of. Got on that time. Now looking for Max. Three hundred, four hundred, sorry. Four fifty. Five hundred went for the kick left. Throw it. Near enough. Seven hundred. There's a supersonic boom. Shoot one. Busted, nothing. Shoot two. Recycle. Shoot one. Shoot two. Engines off at 400. Busted, fuck, fuck, busted, shoots. Both parachutes fail, and the car is beginning to overshoot. As I see, negative shoots, negative shoots, going long. I see copies, negative shoots, negative shoots. Recovery, overrun, overrun. They'll have to turn around in less than an hour, and both runs need to be an average of over 760 miles an hour. Okay, mile. Seven. Six, four, point, one, six, eight. 
But the speed of sound varies. It has to be above Mach 1. Okay, and the provisional Mach number, I'm still working on that. Oh, come on, Petrali! They're going for it. Wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Hey, you're getting off, you're getting off. Get on with it. Go, go. The car has overshot by more than a mile. It'll take nearly 20 minutes to tow it back to the start. They're going to have to turn around faster than they've ever done it before to get back within the hour. Yep. Assuming they can find out what happened to the chutes, we're going again. What a boom! Let's go! Station, this is USAC timing. Oh. Shit. Yes, timing, go ahead. Uh, provisional Mach number on that run was 1.007. Oh. Yeah. Come on. Stop. Come on, there, Steve. That's it. You're on. I'll take it around to the roof, Julian, with this. Not yet, not yet, Mike. Still connected. Station standby, two minutes, two minutes. Two minutes to roll. Two, two minutes to roll. Mallet from Fire Chase. Dog. What? Four months bottom, these ones are going. <coughs> Happy to run with it like that. So am I, because the lead is right, so. Yeah, okay, let's do it then. It's Monday 13th, we've got about one and a half minutes to get this car rolling, or we're out of time. Possibly only one minute. As soon as Nick appears, we're going to go for it. Station standby, SSC is armed and his engine starts. Yes! You set timekeeping is ready. Engine start! You set timekeeping is ready. Pit station SSC ready to roll. SSC clear to roll. All stations SSC rolling. <laughs> Sorry, engines, no choice. for mill. It's a good mill, left engine's responding better, looking for min. That's good, looking for max. Now focus. Max burn at 300. Lost the light temporarily, there it is. 400. 500, stand by for the go left, there it goes. Get it back. Pick up the line again, still have it. He comes back even faster. Shockwaves appear just above the car. Everything depends on whether they've turned around within the hour. Pit station SSC, the car is stopped. SSC copy. All stations SSC has stopped. You're safe, Andy. You're safe. Safe. SSC copied. All stations SSC is safe. Safe, safe. Station, this is USAC timing. USAC timing, uh, can you confirm that run was within the hour, over? Um, unfortunately, I cannot do that. You missed it by about a minute. No, no. Copy, sir, ready to copy speeds and read back. Now, after every run, the car needs more and more repairs. No one knows how much more it can take. 
Parachutes don't work this time. I think somebody might be looking for a rail and a barrel of tar and some feathers. They'll be run out of town. Yesterday's turnaround team are now waiting at the receiving end. I don't really want it to end, do you? Mm. Really? No. Just like they can stay out here and keep running it up and down. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> what are we going to do next, I know. Holiday, senor. Get a real yeah. job. Yeah, go back to yeah. being a hairdresser. <laughs> No. Good yeah. job, because you're useless as a singer. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Not a problem, any time. Uh, they want some shelf stackers at Tesco's, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> what would it be like to do a nine-to-five job now? Wouldn't do it. <sighs> Wouldn't do a nine-to-five job. Do uh, ten till three. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, mate. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, well, we, we ain't done it yet. We ain't done it yet. OK, high pump is on and running. Voltages are good. Fuel flow from both tanks quicker than I'd like. Gauge is staying on for this one. ASI vent is closed. Run 66, it's the second run on Wednesday the 15th of October, looking for a return run within one hour. Copy, two minutes to run. All stations standby, two minutes to run, That's two it, minutes then. to run. Oh. <laughs> oh, come on, come up. SSC is ready to roll. SSC, with Park rolling, clear to Sonic. Clear to Sonic. He's rolling! <laughs> This was the last time that Thrust SSC ever ran under its own power. The average for the two runs was 763 miles an hour. 
but more important, they were both faster than the speed of sound. Andy Green had shattered the sound barrier. I agree with you. <laughs> oh, can we go home now? I tell you from a personal point of view, it scared me. It seriously scared me. Um, I've never actually seen a land speed record car run before because I'd always been in it. And up to five and six hundred and fifty, that was fairly straightforward. But once we were up in the seven hundreds and seven fifties, uh, it seriously frightened me. I mean, the, the prospects of an accident there are absolutely horrendous. And frankly, I was really glad that we were able to pull it to a halt and stop it.